Good morning. On behalf of Dr. Joyce Walker, our Humanities Alliance Director, who could not be with us today, thank you for joining us for this special Humanities Center event. Thank you also to the Everett Community College Foundation for its ongoing support of the humanities. Our speaker today is Andrew Tatey. Dr. Tatey is an Associate Professor of English at Seattle University. He earned a Doctorate of Philosophy degree in English from St. Louis University, where he specialized in Renaissance 19th and 20th century literature. He has been awarded nine postdoctoral fellowships and scholarships, including two Andrew Mellon Foundation fellowships. Dr. Tatey is the founder of the Faith and Great Ideas program at Seattle University, the founder of the Seattle University Marksmanship Club, and the founding director of the Seattle G.K. Chesterton Society. He has worked for many years as a faculty associate and an honors program mentor for the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. He has served as a curriculum consultant for the Plant College of St. Athanasius in Illinois. Dr. Tatey is the co-editor of two volumes of essays which are available in the Everett Community College Library, Permanent Things, Toward the Recovery of a More Human Scale at the End of the 20th Century, and The Riddle of Joy, G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis. He is also a Dahlia and Rose Grower and a Cabinet Maker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Tatey. Thank you, Jeffrey, for that uh, kind and generous introduction. Uh, it's always a little unsettling because now I have to try to live up to <laughs> all those things you said about me. Uh, almost everyone here is from Grace Academy. Who are you? Good. Uh, I cannot recall when I've uh, spoken to a group of high school students. Uh, however, this doesn't worry me in the least because I'll be talking about a subject that actually you know a lot more about than I do. Uh, futuristic fiction. Uh, even though uh, you're much younger than I, I am, I suppose most of you have seen uh, reruns of Star Trek, how many have? Good, so you know about, you know about futuristic fiction. Uh, how, many, how many have seen the first of the Star Wars films? Oh, good, almost everyone. Ah. These are, of course, uh, classics of futuristic fiction. And it, there are so many futuristic movies since the first one was made in 1920, a silent. There have been, up to the present time, 528 science fiction movies. It's a common kind of story, part of the culture. Yet there's something unusual about this. Futuristic fiction, in the way we understand it, is a very, historically a very recent kind of storytelling. When you look back in the history of, of literature, you know, Gilgamesh, Homer's Odyssey, the Iliad, Virgil's Aeneid. When they talk about history in those very few, when they talk about the future in those very few places, it's always very brief, very vague, and, all, and, and transcendental. That is, that in the distant future, when it's referred to, Odysseus, for example, confers with the spirit of the dead prophet Tiresias, who knows the future. He tends to be very 
reluctance in revealing what he knows. But uh, Odysseus asks him, among other questions, will I get home and where will I die? And Odysseus, how many of you have read uh, the Odyssey? Uh, just a few. Uh, it's an adventure story of a great hero, a great, great king. Spent uh, 10 years fighting uh, in the Trojan War, another 10 years getting back home. And Teresia says, you'll get back home, but you're going to die at sea away from home. And Odysseus just he hears it, believes it, and never, never pays attention to it again. In the Aeneid, in the sixth book, Aeneas is led into the underworld where he sees the regions of the souls of the dead. And when he finally comes upon his hero father uh, in the Elysian fields, uh, they converse and his father tells him a few things. And at the very end of book six, there are these lines that should strike us strangely. When Aeneas gets out of the underworld, he's not sure whether he's actually had an experience or whether it was just an odd dream. There are no, in ancient literature, in literature up to the end of the 18th century, no futuristic fiction, no, fu no futuristic stories of the type that we know. And why is it that something so popular today simply is something that earlier writers before the mid 18th century didn't engage in? And I will say that there are two exceptions to this. It's a certain kind of fiction that differs from what we know as futuristic fiction. One kind does concern the future, and that is apocalyptic fiction that always tends to be very mystical and unrealistic. When we talk about what we know as futuristic stories, we, we imagine that action to be real. But reading, say, the book of Revelation, the end of the Bible, it's certainly futuristic, it concerns the end of the world, but it's mystical. The descriptions don't really conform to our own experiences of reality. And the other type of fiction and there's one notable example of it, and that is uh, Gulliver's Travels. The, Jonathan Swift wrote this work in the 18th century when another kind of story was very prominent. It has to do with the discovery of the new world. And there are vast number of accounts, some realistic, some fictional, about what was discovered in the New World, both here in the Americas and in the Orient. And Gulliver's Travels is actually a satire, a pointed satire, using, kind of inverting, uh, the conventions of travel fiction. But what happens at the end of the 18th century? I want to refer here to a, a theorist named Baudin, who actually conceived this theory of a new kind of fiction making. And he had certain rules for it. And these rules uh, included a story set in the distant future, but in places 
that were known or could be conceived easily. And the action would involve in the future uh, a lot of fantastical machinery and the action would focus on a kind of military hero. So what, how did Baudin conceive of these, of, this, of these ideas for this new kind of fiction? First, the French Revolution, the end of the 18th century, and, the, and how bloody and protracted it was. You're all pro probably familiar with the uh, the execution of so many of the French nobles by Madame Guillotine, uh, you're uh, probably going to be less aware of the revolutionaries who would virtually wipe out villages that were in favor of the monarchy, that didn't go along with the program, the state's program. And Baudin thought that something like a military hero, somebody like a Napoleon, would restore order to society. So in, in his theory, projecting these stories into the distant future, these would be unsettling stories and society would become settled because of a military kind of hero. Secondly, at this very same time, it's the beginning of one of the real great revolutions in human history, the Industrial Revolution. The emphasis on machinery, on technology. And this theory authors use to develop stories along these lines. But in the middle of the 19th century, Jules Verne, and you probably know that name, who became very wealthy writing futuristic stories, he conceived of a different kind of story. And that's because of the developments that were going on just about 60 years later. Having to do with significant advances that have occurred. The development of the steam engine that would, could drive locomotives and within a few decades, the globe is laced with railroad tracks. It's the end of clipper ships and the beginning of steam powered ships and the increase in international trade. There are huge developments in medicine. Think about Pasteur, discovery that some kinds of bacteria cause disease. And also, the very beginnings of a discipline we take for granted now, but as a separate academic discipline, it's really quite new, and that is the discipline of psychology. And futuristic writers, some of them, will craft stories in which there will be a villain character who has certain powers over the minds of other people. Or you will have heroes of the Jules Verne type in which the hero is an intellectual adventurer. He's no longer a military hero He's an educated man who's interested in new things, in, ex in discovering new things, and using new inventions to accomplish his purposes. Uh, Jules Verne was, I think, a major influence about 50 years later on H.G. Wells, one of the two authors I want to focus on this morning. But it describes something about Wells's life, which uh, 
is so very different than our second author's, uh, G.K. Chesterton. They had very different backgrounds. They lived about the same time. They were actually, and this, one, this is a question you might want to discuss towards the end of the, this period. How is it that somebody so different from Chesterton as H.G. Wells, so different in so many ways, it's hard for me to imagine where they agreed on anything. And both were very popular authors, both made a great deal of money publishing works of all kinds. They debated publicly. This was at a time when it was a common kind of public entertainment. Formal debates and the people would come in crowds to hear these great, would hear great famous people debate one another. I'm not sure I understand altogether, only partly, how it is that two such very different men in temperament, in background, in personality, and in beliefs could be friends. And actually that is something I've thought about in a different way in very current times. I'm trying to think of how many people, certainly at my university, um, would be friends with a, a supporter of Donald Trump <laughs> that would sit around and actually engage in an intellectual discussion. It's a time of you know, campus protests, citywide protests, and so on. It's not a time when people with very different views are really interested in presenting their case when another person is presenting theirs and the two of them are friends. Something I don't see much, maybe it's a little different here in Everett, but uh, in Seattle, it, it just doesn't happen. How is it that uh, Wells could be such a good friend of Chesterton's when uh, he came from a lower middle class background. His parents were domestic servants. He was born into, uh, as I said, a lower class household. And all, from an early age, first resented being poor. And secondly, from a very early age, he was a voracious reader. He was clearly a young man who, was, who had enormous intellectual capabilities. And when he was 18, he won a scholarship to study biology at the Royal College in London. And he was heavily influenced by a very famous teacher and writer at the time, Thomas Huxley. The, may, the name may not be familiar to you, but I think his ideas are. Thomas Huxley, Huxley is known as Darwin's bulldog. You all know, I'm sure, about Charles Darwin, theory of evolution. And Huxley was the one who advocated using the Darwinian model in terms of human society. That, given enough time, life moves from one cell creatures to two cell creatures all the way up to the human beings that we have today. 
there's over a given enough time, there is this clearly discoverable progression from something simple to something enormously complex. Huxley was a social Darwinist who was interested in tracing human society in this evolutionary way. How human society progressed from the earliest times to the present times and further where it was heading beyond the end of the 19th century. The model he proposed, and it was one that influenced Wells and influenced his, many of his works afterwards. One of the great progressive shifts over time, in early human society there was this heavy interest in religion as a unifying factor for the continuation of these early societies. And this model develops and gets more complex and more intellectual over time until we get to the 19th century, conveniently when Huxley was living. And since Darwin's model discounted, and Darwin himself discounted a belief in a creating God, that nature was enough to account for the way things are. Huxley observed that religion that had grown to become an enormously intellectual and yet a highly contested way of thinking has petered out. It has been replaced and is gradually going to replace religion with what? Science, the advances in scientific technology. Wells held that view. And it's a view we're going to see in certain scenes in his film, Things to Come. How he takes this idea and creates a fictional, a futuristic fictional story out of it. I mentioned that Wells published, like Chesterton, a wide variety of works. He's, I think today, probably most known for his futuristic fiction. And yet in his own time, he was known as the Moore, as the author of a work called The Outline of History. It's a history book, enormously popular, widely read by the intellectual classes in Europe and America, in which he traces out historically at length the details about the use of religion to organize society, its development, and its decline to be replaced by scientific developments. Wells himself was a utopianist. He really believed this model, given enough time, would create a perfect human society. There would be struggles along the way, but eventually there would be a utopia. And who would be the elite class of leaders? Well, something goes back, I think, to Jules Verne. A council, not of military types, but a council of intellectuals, scientists, and technocrats. These are the wise ones who will push human society forward to a final state of utopia. 
He also wrote an autobiography in uh, which he describes his life and states that two things have been most important for him and for his thinking. The first I've just described, his belief that society will progress scientifically and ultimately arrive at a state of utopia. The second, he was probably the most famous advocate of free love and the rejection of monogamy, family life, that human beings, he believes, are meant to thrive in this way. All these deeply held beliefs of Wells, Chesterton rejected for his own reasons, which I'll describe in due course. Might be time to look at a few scenes that I've excerpted from his film, The Things to Come. It was produced in 1936. It's the 11th science fiction in the history of futuristic fiction, the 11th futuristic movie. It is uh, a movie that at the time has been cited as the most expensive movie ever made. And when you consider what films were like in 1936. I think even while you're gonna be seeing a black and white film and a lot of the con movie conventions that, you're, that you will witness um, have been advanced certainly in major ways by the time we get to Star Wars. But so many of those conventions, those ideas, those techniques are really shown here in this film. The expenses were enormous. The actors were among the most famous in their day, including three Shakespearean actors. And I mention that in particular because when you see these speakers, they're going to have a, an effect more like watching a stage play where an actor has to project in a different mode than what we're used to in movies. But there's plenty of action in this story. The story begins four years after the film was actually made. It begins in 1940 and it continues with scenes in 1967, 1970, and 2036, at which point Utopia has reached nearly its peak. The main characters and their children and their children's children thread throughout all these scenes. What you will see at the beginning is something that Wells is prophetic about. He predicts four years in advance World War II, and more particularly, he predicts the aerial invasion of Germany by, uh, on England, the bombing of England. 
And while it's not part of the film, he also predicted that what would cause World War II was Germany's invasion of Poland, England had a treaty with Poland, the beginnings of World War II. And he predicted this in advance. It's remarkable. What you're going to see in this first scene is uh, Christmas time, 1940. And you're going to see, and this is an important setup for the story, you're going to see Christmas time. Londoners, the crowds of London, in the Christmas spirit, at the same time that there's this threat of war. And this scene will continue when these three friends that I mentioned earlier, one a, an intellectual and Air Force pilot, Army pilot, English Army, Royal Air Force pilot, Royal Army pilot in the Air Force. His friend, Dr. Harding, who is a medical researcher, and a fellow named Passworthy, who is, I've always had a fondness for this character. He's optimistic, he's got the Christmas spirit, he doesn't really believe war is going to happen, but all three are close friends, and they gather together at the intellectual's house to celebrate Christmas. That main character is named John Cabal. Can you show the first scene?
That was the beginning of the film. And from the beginning, we see the setup, the contrast between Christmas and warfare. For Wells, religion has been a failure in being able to eliminate mass warfare. What does he have in mind particularly? World War I. Eleven million soldiers died in World War I. Seven million civilians died in World War I. Put it in perspective, that number is two and a half times greater than the population of Washington State. Military historians point out that winning a war is really often not enough. If you win a war, that has caused so much devastation, 
even though you're, vic you're a victor and can decide the terms of the truce, the devastation simply wasn't worth going to war. Wells believed that. The setup in this opening scene in which Christianity, Christmas, and the threat of war, what Christianity has failed to do to end all war is something that Wells thought was possible. Possible because of the advances in scientific technology, but with a caveat. Who is going to manage the development of the scientific technologies and who's going to control it? That leads us to the observation I made earlier. What's needed is, for Wells, a world state governed by a council of intellectuals, scientists, and technocrats. Without that model, Wells believed, wars would continue. And having gone through the experiences and the horrors of World War I, he thought that was the most important human problem to solve at all costs. The next scene is, I'm going to show you, is just very brief. Uh, and I. I think this is really a kind of, we consider it's 1936, how the special effects were so effective. What you're going to see is the aerial bombings, uh, bombing by German aircraft of the city of London and the panic that ensues. In, the, in these scenes of destruction, there's one thing that uh, struck me as being very smartly done. 
Uh, the, what do you say, the, what's the first building that was destroyed? The cinema. And imagine people watching this film in a cinema. <laughs> and what's the very last scene we see is the destroyed sign of the cinema. To bring, as it were, the, 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 the fear of war into the, uh, the cinema where people are watching this film. The next thing you'll see, same location, it's Everytown, London, in 1967. And you'll see a script on the screen that explains that after the war has ended, a, long, a war that was actually longer than the real Second World War, uh, there is such devastation that eventually led to an epidemic uh, that wiped out, as you'll see on that signage on the screen, wiped out half the world's population. Then the scene shifts uh, You'll see scenes about what, how primitive life has become as a result of the uh, Second World War.
So much devastation after the Second World War that human society has formed into what we might call small, little, or mid-sized villages that compete with one another. In scenes you won't see, uh, London, uh, this area of London is competing with neighboring little cities, uh, and this is. Uh, London is ruled by this military hero, uh, the chief. Uh, he is, uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes who that actor is, that's Sir, Sir Ralph Richardson, one of the great Shakespearean actors uh, of that period. Um, we've gone back so far, we can't progress. And then onto the scene, comes this advanced aircraft. And it happens to be piloted by the elderly John Cabal. He will explain in this next scene what his purpose is for flying and landing here in London. He will meet his old friend, now the elderly Dr. Harding, the medical researcher. And then later he will be interviewed by the chief. And you're going to see this very strong contrast between social orders that are governed by military force against what Cabal represents social order governed by this kind of an elite class of which he is the intellectual. What has happened at the time of the Second World War? The world's leading intellectuals, scientists, and technocrats have all migrated to Persia, where they have rebuilt civilization along advanced scientific lines. And now they intend to move from having pacified the Mediterranean area, they're moving now to Europe and England, all to achieve a kind of one world state governance. Thank you. 
injection. The first thing we shall want is to get our planes in the air again. What? A laudable ambition. But our new order has an objection. Private aeroplanes. The impudent. I'm not talking about private aeroplanes. Our aeroplanes are public aeroplanes. This is an independent, sovereign state at war. I know nothing about any old order. I'm the chief here, and I'm not taking any orders old or new from you. Suppose I walked into trouble. Yeah, you can take that as right. Where do you come from? I flew from my headquarters in Bazaar this morning. We have some hundreds of new type planes. We're building more, fast. The factories are working again. We're gradually restoring order and trade in the whole Mediterranean area. We're scouting this region now to see how things are. You found out. This is an independent, sovereign state. Yes, if we thought about that. We don't discuss it. We don't approve of independent, sovereign states. You don't approve. We mean to stop them. That's war, if you will. Well, I think we know how we stand. But you take it, man. You get you any trouble, club it. You hear that? the wings over your wit. Well, the contrast should be very clear. Cabal representing a social ideal of the world at peace, the world governed by a class of the best and the brightest. And the chief representing the nation state. In a scene that I'm not going to show, the chief's wife um, comes to converse with Cabal, who's being held as a prisoner in the cellar. And actually, she's quite a very good actress. Uh, and she reveals, confesses to uh, Cabal how how much she wants to travel, how adventurous she is, how much she's interested in new experiences and new ideas. And she feels, well, she's, she's glad to be the chief's wife, but she wants more than that. In this next scene, we're going to see how advanced Wings Over the World really is. They're using science to achieve their ends, to end all war, by pacifying uh, local populations, one after the other. And they do this by not dropping what we saw at the beginning of the, mo uh, the, of the uh, movie, bombs from the air, but canisters of sleeping gas. So then the army can come in, can drop down from the plains with parachutes and uh, conquer the territory. Thank you. 
The scene in a moment will shift to 2036. Wings Over the World has created a new civilization, a utopia, and they, they built it underground. The uh, surface of the earth is just filled with the remnants of destruction. One of the, uh, I think, artful touches, the director had uh, the chief do as he's dying. Pulls out a pistol and just shoots aimlessly, grabs a hold of a rope, rings a bell. It's the death knell of the old world order. And the bringing in of the new world. In this next scene, um, you're going to see something about the uh, environment of this utopia, and uh, it will then lead us eventually to a dispute a controversy, a controversy that arises between two factions, the governing council and a famous sculptor in an artist in Utopia who certainly enjoys life very much as it is. He's productive, he's prominent, and he is opposed to the governing council's wish to advance scientific progress beyond the earth.
The actor who plays the sculpture, Sir Cedric Hardwick, another famous Shakespearean actor. Um, because of his status as a great artist, he has the, uh, the privilege of addressing the whole of the public. And this is what he, he does. What you're going to see is a the people gathered together and this enormous projection screen slides down and he gives his impassioned speech. What is it that he's opposed to? The governing elite who have achieved utopia on earth look for the next step to achieve additional progress. And that leaves only the exploration of outer space. And in 1936, this is a radical prophecy. How many years before Russia sends up the first satellite into orbit? We've uh, taken on a good deal of this Wellsian attitude of not just looking here about affairs on Earth, but exploring uh, as much of the universe as possible. In the next, this next scene, brief scene, it's the sculptor making his case to the public.
the case he makes against progress. Isn't that people should do nothing? He's obviously a sculptor, a master sculptor, and he, and he has a work. He has a talent to accomplish something. He's not opposed to that. This is what he enjoys doing. And he knows that other people enjoy other kinds of pursuits. If attention is given solely to advancing progress, where is the time to simply enjoy life in the way that you prefer? When is there time for simply stepping back, reflecting, and just enjoying existing? I think there's something, and I'll qualify this later, there's something about this sculptor that Chesterton focuses on. In this last and final scene that ends the film, You're going to see a controversy concerning this giant cannon. And about three quarters of the way down to the right, you're going to see this capsule, space capsule. The capsule is to house two people. It's the first exploration of outer space, and the task is to circumnavigate the moon and return. Just so happens that the two young adventurers who want to do this, these astronauts, uh, one happens to be Cabal's daughter. He is the great grandson of the original John Cabal. And a young fellow who is a descendant from uh, that character we saw at the beginning of the uh, film, Passworthy. And Cabal and Passworthy have a conversation. Passworthy is arguing for, as it were, the domestic life, a father's natural tendency not to have his child endure an enormous risk. And Cabal, who certainly knows about these risks, is much more contented to let his daughter pursue the adventure.
beyond the conflict. So if this little rat and its winds and waves, and in all the laws of mind and matter that restrain it, then the planet's about it. And at last, out across the mentors to the sky. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. But we're such little creatures. The way humanity is so fragile, so weak. Little, little animals. Little animals. If we're no more than animals, we must snatch each little scrap of happiness and live and suffer in the past. Mattering no more than all the other animals do or have to. It is this or that. All the universe for nothing. Which shall it be? Which shall it be? Observations. Uh, the uh, film score, music composed and conducted by one of the great orchestral composers and conductors in the 20th century, Sir Arthur Bliss. I mentioned early, early on that this uh, film was enormously expensive. It ends with this great rousing chorale in response to which shall it be. We're only given two choices here. At the end, Passworthy and Cabal. One thing that I find a little disconcerting, something that's not addressed in this ending scene, but I think that uh, Wells would, in the end, approve. Do you remember when the massive population is coming to stop the cannon from shooting up the castle, shooting the capsule up to space? Cabal is above, yelling down, beware of the concussion, beware of the concussion. And the population is surrounding this, the base of the cabin. They're climbing up the scaffolds. Does he, de does he decide to delay the launch? How many of the population, the common people, will perish in order to pursue this ambition of pursuing progress into outer space? I wish I had a, a little more time uh, to discuss some of the details of Chesterton's novel than the Napoleon of Notting Hill. He takes on so many of these same questions Wells deals with in this movie. But as yet, no one has made a movie of the Napoleon of Notting Hill. If they did, it would be a futuristic fantasy. It starts out in 1984. Now, the 1984 that you know, who wrote it? How many people know 1984? Good. Who wrote it? Orson. Pardon? Orson. Orson. Uh, no. Orson something. <laughs> who wrote it? George Orwell. George Orwell. George Orwell. Right, yes. After, after, this, this novel itself was very, uh, very popular. In fact, it was one of the works that inspired the leader of uh, the Irish Republican Army in fighting England that eventually led to the formation of the two Irelands, North Ireland and South, South Ireland. Uh, it was an attempt, the Irish Revolution was an attempt to 
restore a small culture, breaking away from the, uh, the empire, the British Empire. Um, I'm sure all of you know about the recent breakup of the European Union and the controversy that has ensued. England is working itself out of the European Union. <laughs> there are other members that are thinking about doing the same thing, not those members that uh, rely on benefices from the Union, but those many of the nations who supply money to supply the benefices for the other nations. Chesterton's perspective on human society is altogether different from Wells because he starts at a different place. He doesn't, he doesn't think ultimately that human beings are governed by social movements. Certainly we're influenced by the culture that we're in. But fundamentally, every human being loves some things uniquely that lots of other people don't enjoy at all. And some of those loves are so deep that they will sacrifice themselves in order to achieve or to preserve what it is they love. For lots of people, it's another person. It's marriage and the procreation of the race. For others, it's like our sculptor. You've got this talent and you want to pursue it. And you will sacrifice yourself to get good at it. Every human being has a different kind of love. It's highly focused. And that's what drives individual human beings. And the problem with governing society is how do you organize so many different people that love so many different things, including those people who love the pursuit of empire and love the pursuit of their own local place. Chesterton doesn't believe that ultimately this is a solvable problem because at the heart of human nature, as I said, we have these strong individual loves and we pursue what we love. Chesterton himself was a populist. He understood all the problems with a belief in the people. But he says, that's what we are. That's what we've got to deal with. The problem goes on. Let me mention something particular about the novel to illustrate this point. His novel begins in 1984, and the world has become a utopia. And it's governed by an elite bureaucratic class, and everything is going along swimmingly. And in his utopia, there is a, a convention. The, the monarchy hasn't really died out, but it's a lot like Queen Elizabeth. She doesn't really have a lot of political power, but she's got, she's got money, she's got some resources, and you know, when she favors certain things, they tend to get done. There is no hereditary monarchy. It's, the monarchy is passed on by lot. Everybody, everybody in the population has a chance to become the next monarch. And the next one, early on in the novel, the monarchy gets passed by lottery to Auberon Quinn. If you know anything about uh, Germanic and Celtic mythology, the role of Oberon, he's a puckish kind of character, very unpredictable. He's very unique. He is eccentric, beyond imagining. And he has this idea, and this is something that Wells doesn't address. Let's say you have your utopia. 
What makes life interesting? Not everybody is interested in pursuing scientific progress or pursuing some great dangerous adventure. Different people are inclined, they love to do different things. And you've got this puckish king who decides just to break the boredom. He's going to divide London into neighborhoods. <laughs> the old neighborhoods, the ones that have been in existence for two, two three or four hundred years. And declare that you've got to have some pageantry that's unique to each neighborhood. And this goes along well until the king out on a walk one day comes upon a boy named Adam Wayne. He's just a little child and he is playing with his wooden sword. And the king comes up to the child and says, ah, you are defending your neighborhood. And the boy doesn't quite know what that means. And the, uh, the king explains it to him and then pulls out a coin and gives it to the boy in appreciation for his heroism. The, sh the scene shifts many years later. The boy has grown up to be a man and he is the provost of this particular neighborhood called Notting Hill. The Napoleon of Notting Hill is Adam Wayne. And it just so happens the bureaucracy has decided we're gonna put a new roadway and we're gonna to need to go through Notting Hill and we're gonna confiscate the property. And it's all legal. And Adam Wayne resists and eventually is able to persuade the others in his neighborhood to resist and there is a war. And the uh, bureaucracy decides we're going to send in 500 men, there are just a few people there, and we're going to be armed. And because they don't know the streets in the neighborhood, they get ambushed and they have to retreat. So the bureaucracy sends in more soldiers. And They've surrounded Notting Hill. They've conquered the streets and they've sent out an emissary saying that you're going to be vanquished militarily if you don't surrender. The answer comes back, if you don't surrender, we are going to uh, let loose the water 50 tons of water from London's reservoir that they control, and we will wash all you out of the streets. <laughs> and so the bureaucracy surrenders. <laughs> the empire ends. There's much more to the novel that occurs later. Uh, I invite you to read it. It's very inexpensive. I think it costs under $5 from Dover Press.